Welcome to our real quick uh, ground lesson. VFR, IFR, IMC, what do these acronyms mean? These are very specific. The Federal Aviation uh, Administration has put down rules and regulations for us to uh, follow. And they are called VFR, or Visual Flight Rules, IFR, Instrument Flight Rules, IMC, what is IMC? It's Instrument Meteorological Conditions. This one is kind of interesting. You'll hear a lot of pilots say, I flew into the soup. When you hear them say that, they're talking about IMC. We're going to go over a few of these things. We're also going to look at some charts that IFR pilots use a lot to do their planning. For visual flight rules, basically, we want a clear day where we can see everything. That's what VFR is. You want to be able to see and avoid. This particular picture is from a 172. It is flying transition through Los Angeles International Airspace. This is the Pacific Ocean, and here are the uh, runways, taxiways for Los Angeles International Airport. For visual flight rules, the FAA requires five miles of visibility clear clouds below 18,000 feet. Other weather, weather minimums do apply. I will be uh, showing you what those are a little bit later. But what does that mean? I have to be able to see five miles. I must stay clear of clouds below 18,000 feet. Anything above 18,000 feet requires you to be an instrument rated pilot. It requires you to have an instrument flight plan. And you must be talking to somebody at all times. The reason for that, when you get above 18,000 feet, things start to look really different. The distances you judge of a landmark to be could be much further away than they actually are. So the FAA has decided that 18,000 feet and below is going to be VFR when you can see, IFR when you cannot. Anything above 18,000 feet must be under instrument conditions. This is an example of flying above 18,000 feet. As you can see, I can see all the mountains all the way over to the curvature of the Earth on the horizon. Judging distance from this altitude gets a little tricky. If you've ever gone to the skyscraper and the tall, uh, at the very top floor and looked down, the distance that you can see is much greater than if you were on the ground. So judging your distances makes it much more difficult. IFR is the most useful rating for pilots, from jumbo jets to small little planes. I have put a lot of time in the Piper Arrow. It's a beautiful aircraft. I've also put some time into these jumbo jets. They are a lot more sophisticated. The computers do a lot more of the flying. But IFR is IFR, whether you're flying this guy or your small little plane. All the rules apply. You must be able to use your stick and rudder to control the aircraft. Even if you have all these fancy autopilot this, autopilot that, you still need to be able to do your job without any help from the equipment. If you're flying along, your equipment fails, you still need to be able to navigate and fly the aircraft. Let's go ahead and take a look at one of the things we use. This is called a low altitude en route chart. I have got a better example. Um, I'll go ahead and pull that up in a little bit. This is that Piper. It's actually from the computer-based X-Plane. What we have here is we have our artificial horizon. These two instruments here, these are very, very important. These three, this is what is called a VOR. This is also a VOR. And this is your uh, flight director navigation system. The VOR, which stands for VHF Omni Range, this tells you where you are from this particular fix. So I want to fly from point A to point B. If I was flying visually, I could go all over the place so long as I can see and avoid. Under instruments, I must fly from waypoint to waypoint. That is changing, however, with the adaption of the GPS system. But when you get into the low altitudes, 18,000 feet and below, they want you flying from point A, point A to point B. Low altitude airways are called Victor airways. High altitude airways are called Jet airways or Juliet airways. 
This is my airway name, Victor146. I can either come from Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. It is still going to be Victor146. This little box here that tells me the distance between point A and point B on this Victor airway. This little number here, that tells me my minimum altitude for this particular airway. One of the other things the FAA does to do separation, you'll notice that all IFR is even meaning you will go two zero 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 zero. You won't see uh, 2125. You won't see any odd numbers. They'll always be even. This creates separation. VFR, or Visual Flight Rules Traffic, must do odd. And it also depends on whether you're going east or west. Another way to keep separation. So if you're going westbound on Victor 146 and your instrument flying, you must be even thousand. If you are under visual flight rules and you still want to follow this airway, you will be odd, which means you'll be 2,500 feet. VFR or IFR traffic will be 2,000 feet. Another way to keep people separated. How do I find that here? Well, these neat little things are called radials. They come off the station. So this is going to be my 019er from Martha's Vineyard or I'm going to fly outbound course of 300 from Nantucket. What I would do is I would plug in, if I want to go to the station, I would go ahead and plug in the reciprocal of 300, which is about 150. As long as this line here is lined up like you see, that means I'm on that Victor Airway and I'm flying just fine. This little thing here we'll get into is called my localizer and my ILS, <clears throat> excuse me, instrument landing system. I'm going to pause for a second. Sorry about that. What this one does is it gives me not only horizontal guidance, but it gives me lateral guidance. This instrument comes very, becomes very important when I'm flying an approach. This one I use for navigation and it can be localizer only. This one encompasses both. It will give me my vertical and horizontal path to the runway. Another instrument that I'm going to use a lot is my vertical speed indicator. This is how fast I'm going up and down. As some of you might guess, this is my altimeter. This is my airspeed indicator. And I want to talk about that for a second. This indicates airspeed, how fast I'm flying through the air, not ground speed. Ground speed is how fast I'm going over the ground. So when you're driving in your car doing 35 miles an hour, you're going 35 miles an hour over the ground as indicated by your speedometer. In the air, this could indicate, indicate that I'm doing 130 miles an hour, but my ground speed is only 65 miles an hour. How would that happen? Well, I'm hitting the headwind. My plane's going super fast, but that headwind's slowing me down, so my ground speed is going to be much different. These are what we call our radio stacks. The left one is going to be used for my communications when I talk to the tower. The other side, which is not in the picture, is what gives information to these particular instruments. This one, not used so much anymore. This is called an ADF or an automated, or automated direction finder. This hones in to AM stations. We can go back to the chart. Whoops. Go back to the chart. You can see one. Right here, this would be an ADF. These are being phased out. You'll hear pilots refer to these as steam gauges. This is the old cell. This is how I originally learned to fly. When you jump into these, this is all glass cockpit aircraft, meaning we have computer displays for everything. This instrument here, which is tied in to my flight director, what is a flight director? It's the computer that controls everything. This is how we go ahead and set the machine. This is what we do to tell it to fly left, fly right from waypoint to waypoint. But this instrument here encompasses this instrument, this one, this one, as well as directional, and this instrument. You'll notice in this fancy 
Fancy A320. This is also the A330. I've flown these before. You'll notice that you have backup instruments. That's there in case all of your computers go out. Each pilot must learn how to fly without flight director and all that information. You have to do this manually just in case something happens here. This information here, you might wonder, is basically my engine management system. It tells me how fast the engines are going, what the exhaust gas temperature is, etc. This one, as we can see, is the artificial horizon. I apologize for the picture. It's not that great. On the right will be our altitude. To the right of that is going to be our vertical speed indicator. That is this little instrument here. It tells you how fast you're going up and down. The left of that is also a course indication system. So all of these instruments help us navigate using these charts. If we can't see anything, we have to make sure we're following this information. So if I'm going to be on Victor 146, I'll set it here or here. Now that's a lot of information. This is just an introduction for those that are interested in flying. The first thing you'll do when you learn to fly is you'll get what your VFR ticket, your visual flight rules. Then you're going to go for another rating, which is your instrument flight, flight rules. When you get into multi-engine aircraft, you have to get a multi-engine and a multi-engine instrument. So they want to make sure that you are doing everything. They'll say you can take off and land in 40 hours, you'll be able to fly. That's not exactly true. It's a lot more complicated than that only in the emergency procedures. Flying the plane is still flying the plane. Up is up, down is down, right is right, left is left. That doesn't change. When you get into heavier aircraft, you need to learn the aircraft itself. The FAA says that it'll minimum 40 hours, not maximum. There is absolutely no such thing as a maximum. When you get into your instrument uh, rating, again, they'll say around 40 hours. It took me 60 hours. It's just being able to create that muscle control when you're trying to fly the plane. And remember, the air is not always smooth, so you're going to be bouncing all over. Your instruments are going to go up and down due to air pressure changes. So have you ever looked out to Sky Harbor and you see all the aircraft being, it looks like they're being funneled in to the airport. They're all following this particular pattern. When you're under instrument flight rules, you're going to fly in according to particular approaches, a particular arrival. What I pulled up here is called an arrival chart. This is what tells the pilots, okay, you are flying from your Victor airway. Right here, I'm going to fly to this particular airport that's in here somewhere. Well, what happens when I get to a certain point? The FAA wants you to know. If you have lost radio communications, you will follow these procedures no matter what. That way the tower knows what you're doing, approach control knows what you're doing, everybody knows what you are doing so they can provide separation to other aircraft. If you can't see the ground, it's very hard to fly. So they give you the arrival charts and you'll follow those. Let's go ahead and look through this real quick. This is the transition that you would go through for when you follow your flight plan, you're going to say I'm going to go from Denver International Airport to Phoenix Sky Harbor. I'm going to fly this particular route and I'm going to follow this particular transition. This can change at any moment. Sky Harbor could say Cessna 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I want you to do the Arlen 4 arrival doing the Mohawk transition. All that information is on this plate. This is the only plate you're really going to need to pull these transitions into this particular airport. I've got a better picture. We'll talk about that in a minute. This one here is what happens after you've done your approach. You've come in, you've flown your lines, now you're coming down into the airport. Does that look okay? Can we see that? Okay. So what I was talking about is the Blythe transition. I'll go ahead and read this out real quick. When you are doing your flight planning, this happens, you go through all your charts, you go through weather briefings, way before you even get to the aircraft. You'll be filing a flight plan with the FAA under instrument flight rules. 
They'll give you about 30 minutes to get your aircraft ready to go before you lose your takeoff clearance. When you file this information, you're going to say, I'm going to fly from, say, Denver International Airport. We're going to use a Luff C departure from Denver. We're going to fly a particular route. We're go and we'll tell them waypoint after waypoint. We get to our arrival into Phoenix. We'll tell them we're going to use the Blythe transition. This is how we're going to fly that transition. This is what the FAA assumes you are going to do. For that transition, you're going to fly from over the BLH VORTAC, which stands for VOR TACAN. If anybody know, uh, has watched jets come in, they'll come in, uh, military aircraft, they'll come in to private air, uh, uh, public airports. They'll be using different frequencies and different information, but they will still be flying the same approach. That's what this channel 121 means. That uh, is what the military will use to fly this approach. You'll be using this information. But how do I know, once I have tuned my radios to this particular uh, frequency, I need to identify that information. So that's why we still have to use and learn Morse code. We'll actually listen to it over the radio. We'll have positively identified this station. Once that's done, we're going to find outbound course of 089 to this particular fix, so it's so cold. If we are jet traffic, we want to be at uh, flight level 250. We're going to fly this approach to the Arlen intersection. So what's the intersection? These are the intersections here. These are fixes that everybody agrees upon. These are going to be reporting fixes. I'm going to say I'm here. I'm going to follow this path of information. Remember, we can't see outside our plane, so we cannot see other aircraft. We're relying on our precision to fly these and other aircraft to follow their uh, instructions. So once we fly, fly down 0890, we're going to come to Calais. Cali, we're going to go ahead. This is the approach fix information. This is also the navigational information right here that I can verify this fix from. We're going to turn to our left, flying 076. From 076, all of a sudden we get a call from Phoenix. They say, Cessna 182 Charlie Charlie, we want you to hold at Hydra, right turns, and they'll give us an out when we need to be out of this fix. What does that mean? If we're flying along here, they've got too many airplanes. We need to park you somewhere. That's what this little symbol is. This is a holding point. The uh, control tower knows exactly where you are, and you're going to be flying this little pattern here. I'll go through real quick how to fly that particular pattern. So what you're going to do is you're going to come in 060. Once I have a fix, I'm going to go ahead and start my timer because everything is set to time. I will begin a right turn for one minute. I'm going to come to a heading of 215. I will fly that for one minute. I will again, after that one minute, start my turn. I'll come in on the 035 radio or the uh, 215 radio, 035 is a receptacle, come in, fly for one minute till I get to this approach fix, and I will be doing what is called the racetrack. I'm, if anybody's been flying commercially into a busy airport, as a passenger, all of a sudden you sit there, we're banking every few moments what's going on, they put you into a holding pattern. They need to create separation for traffic. Once they clear you out of that holding pattern, You'll continue along your path. At some point along this particular path, they will go ahead and tell you to follow the ILS localizer approach for whatever or whatever approach you're going to fly, which is our next chart. There's a lot of information. I've got a video. I hope it's going to work. That video, will you'll see real world uh, work. But remember I was talking about, you see all that traffic being, it looks like they're being funneled into the airport, and that's exactly what's happening. You've got this neat little funnel here. All traffic is coming in from whatever approach they're doing into your final approach phase. This is where it becomes pretty tricky. This is where this guy comes in, the hand, in handy. This is going to give my horizontal and vertical 
guidance. I'm going to try and keep this centered and this centered. And what that does for me is that keeps me right here along this line inside the funnel. We have a whole bunch of information. This view here is looking at the top of the aircraft down. This is what it would be looking like if somebody was above you flying. This is what it looks like on the side view. So you're now looking at the aircraft from right or left side of the aircraft. What's really nice is when you get into the fancy dancy aircraft, this flight director, you can go ahead and program, it, program in all your transitions and everything. Up here is where you're going to be setting your heading, airspeed. This is also where you're going to be setting your glide slope information. My glide slope is what gives me that horizontal guidance. So, I can, so I'm not going to hit any trees as I come down here hitting any other traffic. That would be a bad thing. That information is right here. I can easily just go ahead and plug in three degrees for that slope let the computer fly it, and I'm just sitting there saying, okay, I'm checking all my equipment, making sure everything works. But remember, you have to be able to fly this manually. So my three degrees glide slope, I can use that information to tell me how fast I need to fly this. And a lot of times you'll have air traffic control sitting there saying, system one, two, three, four, five, I need you to maintain 180 when you had set your landing speed to 160. They're doing that to separate you from traffic or they want you to slow down. You have to be able to slow your aircraft down or speed it up, but still stay in the funnel and on target for your touchdown point. So as you're coming down, this neat little pipe, what happens if you can't see the runway when you get to what is known as decision height, which is about 500 feet above the ground? You still can't see your runway. It depends upon what company you're with. They'll give you specific minimums that you can go down to before you have to do a what is known as a go around. I come down, I can't see anything. I can't see the runway. My gosh, there's a dust storm that's just covered the entire airport. I've been told to go around or I initiate a go around. What does that mean? Right here's my go around information. I'm going to climb straight ahead on runway heading to, uh, to 3,200 feet. Then I'm going to execute a right turn a climbing right turn. I'm going to climb to 5,000 feet. I'm going to come out on a heading at 250. This tells me that I need to intercept the 160 radio from PXR. PXR is this guy here. I need to intercept that. So what I've done is climb, climb, climb. I start turning. I'm climbing, still coming back around. Once I pick up this line here, that information is displayed and the big guys right here, you can see your heading information. This is your uh, glide slope indicator. The glide slope, again, is that uh, descent path you're going in through the air. That information on these old steam gauges where I learned is right here. So once I intercept, I'm going to maintain my 5,000 feet and head out and expect further information once I get to this particular waypoint. And what they'll do is they'll park you. This is what you're going to do is you're going to fly that racetrack pattern here. They're going to park you right there until they can figure out what you're going to do. When you're flying in any conditions, you all, no matter if it's visual flight rules or instrument flight, flight rules, you must always have an alternate. If your airport is closed, all of a sudden the runway is now congested with a whole bunch of ducks. Well, we can't exactly land on ducks. That would be a bad thing. They'll tell you to go to your alternate. This is, uh, again, our charts. Let me zoom in real quick. This is what it looks on a bigger scale. Now, this is all you really, this is what it kind of looks like when you're flying. You don't really see anything. Well, let me show you something. This is where I'm flying. It tells me that I've got altitude issues. Let me go ahead and show what the sectional looks like. This is terrain. You want to avoid that. So that's why they have those minimum in route uh, altitudes. We have terrain. This here is Denver International Airport. We're going to fly all the way down through Colorado, 
down to Phoenix Sky Harbor. This would be flying IFR or VFR. Real quick distinction, when you're flying VFR, you don't have to file a flight plan. It is highly recommended just in case something happens to you en route when you, and you don't arrive at your destination. When you said you're going to, they'll wait probably about an hour. If they still haven't heard from you, they'll start looking for you. So you want to make sure that when you filed, the time en route, when you're going to go, what airport you're going to go to is correct. Under IFR conditions, you absolutely must file this no matter what. We're going to go ahead and enter aircraft identification. So this would be uh, United Airlines 123, SkyWest 265, or if we're flying a private plane, it usually is an, an N number for the United States, G number for uh, Canada and Great Britain. So you'd put something like November 182 Charlie Charlie. Our aircraft type, we could be flying a CRJ-143. This is our true airspeed, our airspeed that is indicated from our speedometer on board our airplane. Our point, route of flight, our destination airport, how many hours en route. We want to make sure that we, uh, we have our departure time correct. This is all in what is known as universal time. Universal time is Greenwich Mean Time. We've all agreed to this. So right here on this flight planner, you can see right now it's July 11th, 2019 at 1443 UTC. What does that mean? 14, uh, that means 243 Universal Time or Greenwich Mean Time. This adjusts as you go east, west, however many hours you are different from Greenwich Mean Time. Right now it's six hours. So let's go ahead and take a look at this while we're in flight. I'm going to go ahead and start the video. Let me know if you can hear as well as see. Not here. The volume is pretty low. This is shooting an approach into uh, Spokane, Washington. He was just ordered to go down to 5,200. So what you can see here is the same gauge as I was talking about. His altimeter is down here. This is that weather map on the big planes. His aircraft has been updated. This is what is known as a Mooney 20C. I've got many hours in that. Airspeed is indicated here. This is what is called our turn bank indicator. I guess whether we're flying left or right. As you can see, I have no visuals outside of this aircraft, so I am solely relying on this information to keep me separated from other traffic, excuse me, from other traffic and from the ground. Now he is flying instrument. You can see the ground here, but when we come in, we're not seeing much of anything. Oh, I am way over. I'm sorry. We'll go ahead and uh, fast forward this to a uh, part here. I do apologize for that. Uh, I went a long on discussion. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and put the uh, video link in there. You can watch the whole thing. But right here, he's picking up some rain. You'll notice that he's unable to see the airport, so they're going to shoot the localizer. I'll speed this up just a little bit. He's going to pop through here. I do apologize <laughs> for the time. Now, where's the runway? It's hard to see. He's picked up the localizer. I can see out my window on my left, on my right. Oh, we are way off. Here's the runway right here. So he just popped through the clouds from here. Waiting for the runway to show up as we're coming in. And there it is. That's basically a quick overview of what we do while flying IFR or VFR. When you have that, I'm going to go ahead and put that link into the chat box. You can watch the whole video. It is takeoff to landing from, I don't remember the, uh, the origination airport, but he is flying into Spokane, Washington. This happens everywhere. What happens if you get into weather? If you're an instrument rated pilot, it's easy to handle. 
If you have any questions, go ahead and type that in the chat box. I went over about six minutes, so you are free to leave at any time. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and type that in the chat box. Thank you for coming.